All right, so uh, we'll, we'll get started here. Um, I gave you guys a, a handout. Did everyone get a, get a handout so we can go over it in the first couple minutes here? Who did not get a handout? Go. Hands way up. Gives me a chance to exercise. All right. Go. Yep, okay, pass it around to the back. Okay, pass it down to that gentleman over there. Okay. Hand out. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> All right, so, so um, before I... You have those notes already. All right, so be before, I got, before I get started with the example, I wanted to just clarify the math that we did last class. Lots of confusion around cross products, right? So um, I'm hoping that this one sheet summary will, will be useful to some of you at least, at least the ones that, were, um, that needed a bit more help. But um, I, I didn't have enough time to cover that in class. The, the idea is very simple. We're going to be using both methods here. I'll switch back and forth between cross product and the second half of that page where you'll see I say, look, in many cases it is easier to do it by geometry. Okay? So basically I've got circular motion. I have an R vector that represents the point from the origin to this outer rim of the circle. And that's point P. And then I say, point P is going to travel in this tangential direction. I want to know what the velocity of P is. And I could either use the cross product method, which is omega cross R, or I can just do uh, the magnitude and direction idea. Omega R is your magnitude, and the direction is just 90 degrees from R in the plane of motion. Right? So you can either do the cross product method, which is good practice for you, or you can do uh, the geometry method. The answer is the same. That's what I show you here as a very simple example. And so I'm going to do that with the very first example that I'm going to show you today. And in fact, I'm going to mostly be using this magnitude direction argument. So hopefully you'll follow along. And then I'm going to show you how to just convert between all three coordinate systems, which is something similar to what you saw in, I think, either your quiz, in the, in the first question of your quiz, or in some of your assignments, you've been asked to convert between coordinate systems. All right, so here's the, here's the first example. The idea is bicycle gear with a chain. So the bicycle gear is going to be rotating in this counterclockwise direction. As it rotates, it's basically dragging the chain along with it. Okay? And it's going to be moving right at this semicircle of the gear. The chain and the gear have to be moving exactly the same way. Okay? And so you're asked. Uh, for a few, um, a few things here, you're asked for the acceleration of point A right there, which is on the chain and moving obviously to the right given the way the gear is rotating. You're given a few pieces of information. The gear is initially at an angular velocity omega naught of zero, so it's rest. Capital R is the radius of the gear, so that's right here. And you're told that there's an angular acceleration of the gear constant at 90 radians per second squared. OK? So how do we tackle this? So the idea, the idea first is we were talking a little bit about the kinematic equations between angular velocity and angular acceleration. And so the very first thing is notice that we're asking you for what happens at t is equal to 3 seconds. And we gave you this constant angular acceleration. First thought might be, well, let's just first figure out what the angular velocity is at three seconds. So the first thing is pull out your, your handy constant acceleration equation, which is that. And that gives you a really, really quick and easy answer. We know that it starts at zero. You're going to accelerate with 90 radians per second squared for three seconds, 270 radians per second. Okay, so that's my omega at three seconds. Okay, so we have that taken care of. 
So the next thing is, let's look at the actual accelerations of these two points. So if I look at point A, acceleration of A, very clearly it's running in the positive x direction. It's horizontal. It's part of the chain. So we clearly know that it's got a value of an AA, and it must only have an I component. And currently, AA is, is unknown. But what else do we know from this diagram about AA? We actually know that AA is the exact same as the tangential acceleration that must be around the gear. Right? So you think about it, the gear, the gear is rotating like this. Here's my, here's my velocity vector, but also this is my AT. My AT is going around that way. And based on my equations last class, you'll remember that my AT vector was written as alpha cross R of P with respect to O. You'll remember this as the component that is tangent, uh, uh, the, the, tangent the tangential component of the acceleration um, of the entire acceleration of point P. So what we can do here is simply say that the magnitude, if you multiply these two together, the magnitude must be alpha times R. So the great thing is we know AA must be alpha times R. That's it. That's the magnitude, right? So in, in, in looking at the, sec the second half of that sheet where I said sometimes direction is way, the, the geometry is way easier than cross products, here is a perfect example. All I need to do is do AA is 90 radians per second squared, right? Again, that's the tangential acceleration, how the speed is increasing. Multiply it by my 0.1 meters, and I've got 9 meters per second squared in the I direction. OK? And so that, that is the final answer for AA. OK? Great, right? So now once we figured out 9i meters per second squared, that's AA, guess what? If we're trying to figure out what AB is, because the gear is rotating in that particular fashion, the tangential acceleration of the gear in all points along that gear must also be 9 meters per second squared. So I'm just going to make a note here, all points on gear have AT equal to 9 meters per second squared. All right. So what does that mean? That means that now I'm going to go try to figure out what my AB is. AB, as I wrote last class, is a combination of tangential and normal accelerations. Therefore, it should look like this. So here's my, here's my AB. Okay, so here's what I wrote last class. I wrote alpha cross R B, and in this case it's B with respect to O. Then I'm going to add it to this omega. In fact, the easier way was negative omega squared R B with respect to O. Like I wrote this as my cross product, right? But the way we should be thinking about it to make things a whole lot easier is you simply say, this has to be the tangential component. So this is AB of T. Add it to what must be the normal component, AB of N. And based on the location of point B here, that means that my ABT is right here like that. It must be in this j direction. And because this is the, con the circle, the concave side where the normal acceleration is, this must be my an pointing into point O. Right? OK? So that, that's my abt. This is my abn. The directions are set. And now all I have to do is actually just figure out my, my magnitudes. So here are my magnitudes. AB is equal to, this is my tangential. It looks like it's pointing straight up in the J direction. And the magnitude is 9 meters per second squared. Okay. 
Then my, my negative omega squared RB with respect to O, I've already pointed it into the correct direction. So all it must be is just this value, omega squared RBO, just the magnitude. And I already know it must be in the negative i, like that. It must be so. OK, so I'm going to calculate my omega squared r now. Final answer, 9.0j. And this is going to be omega, which is 270, let's see here, 270 squared times 0.1, negative 7290i meter per second squared. Okay. So there you have it, my, my, my way of avoiding any confusion with cross products, drawing the vectors and their directions on a diagram, and then figuring out the magnitudes after that, piecing it all back together. Question up at the top. What do you mean by all three coordinate systems? What's that? So all three coordinate systems. So uh, what I mean by that is what we did previously in particles, the IJK the u r u theta, and then the u t u n. So now that we have this in the i j coordinates, let me deal with how do we switch them into the u r u theta and u n u t. So here's what's gonna, here's what it should look like to you. So this is my point B, right? So in the Cartesian coordinates, that's my i j. In my tangential normal, this point B is going this way, so that's my UT, and this must be my UN. And then everyone remembers UR, U theta. UR is opposite from the, or pointing straight out from the radial vector. That's my UR, and this is my U theta. Okay, so that means that if I take that answer, in NT coordinates, this would effectively be 9.0 UT plus 7290 UN. And then for R theta, right, this is exactly the same as my I. So I have negative 7290 UR. And then this is exactly the same as my J U theta. OK? Really, really easy example. I'm just, I mean, obviously there were no angles involved, everything was 90 degrees. So really easy for me to do that conversion. And then it gets a little bit more complicated later on, like you've seen in your kinematics parts, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you, OK, so the question is, what about point A? Should we do uh, all three coordinate system for point A? If you, if you want, but I can tell you one thing, point A is really easy. This is uh, linear in the i direction. What do you think happens to u and u t? Well, Great question, right? This is, this is going to be the direction in the, of motion. So this has to be a ut. But because it's a straight line, we know that there is no un. right? So in this particular case, there is no normal acceleration component. right? And that's an interesting thing about these two points. I managed to connect them and use the exact same tangential acceleration, because that applies to all of the tangential parts around this gear and along the chain. But when it came to a normal acceleration, this one doesn't have a radius of curvature, right? Or it has an infinite radius of curvature. So there cannot be a normal acceleration on the straight line. So this one would be AA is equal to 9 and must be UT meter per second squared. OK? And then the more complicated one would be like u r u theta. You're right. If I did this, right, that would be my r vector for a. Your u r would be in this direction. 
Okay? But, but, but I, the, the actual question did not ask for that. It was actually asking just for three coordinate systems of point B. Um, and it's because I actually didn't really tell you the distance of where A was with respect to O. So we're going to ignore that, but you can see where we're going with that if we wanted to. Okay? Any, any questions on that? Okay, does that, does that help a little bit, connecting the, the cross product formulas with uh, direction, magnitude, and all of that? Okay. Good, so remember that I left off last class on a section 16.3, which was rotation around a fixed axis, right? And that's where we were getting into all of this, you know, omega and alpha and all the kinematics around that. So today, I've got one other section that I want to introduce. We're going to combine the translation and the ro rotation together so that they're happening at the same time. Okay, so you're going to skip, you're going to skip six, uh, section 16.4 and you're going to go straight to 16.5, oops, Okay, so the idea is general plane motion. So first thing I did, 16.2, was translation. And all I did was the object did not rotate at all. And there were two scenarios, rectilinear, straight line, or I could make it curvilinear, but make sure that my particle does not rotate on its axis, right? That was translation. The second one was rotation around a fixed point. So I pick one point here. The whole object just rotates like this, and it's fixed. Right? So what I'm going to do now is when you combine the two, you get this. Right? Basically, the whole thing can just do whatever it wants. Right? And we're going to combine them so that we can actually analyze and get accelerations and velocities and all that. Okay? And the method we're going to use in 16.5 is we're going to call it relative motion analysis should sound familiar. And I'll deal with velocity first and acceleration a little later. So here's my xy. We're still dealing with two dimensions. Okay, so I have a rod here. Okay, and you'll remember that I did this in the past. I did relative motion analysis with particles, and I said we're going to focus on one particular point as the observer. And the observer has these translating axes, x prime, y prime, that move with respect to the fixed axes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my radial vector like that. And that'll be my RA. So this is my point A. Okay. And here's my second point, point B. So this is RB, and this is point B. And so with general plane motion, what we're saying is, and by, by the way, I made, this, uh, I made this a simple rod. A simple rod um, is like the simplest rigid body that we could come up with. I've been previously drawing it as this irregularly shaped blob. Um, but notice that when I drew it last class as an irregularly shaped blob, I still picked two points, A and B. And drawing a straight line connecting them is like this, just a rod. And that's like the simplest rigid body that you can come up with. So I'm going to move this rod 
And it's going to be over here now. And it's going to be at a new location. You can say it's a, a prime, b prime, but I'll leave it as point A and point B. Okay? So what I want to show you is the best way to think about the fact that this particle or this rigid body moved from here to here is you break it up into two independent steps. You think of it first as translating over to here. And then after you've done the translation, you do a peer rotation. OK? So since we've done translation already by itself, and since we've done rotation by itself, infinitesimally over time, every single little general plane motion is essentially a combination of the two. OK? So I'm going to draw that. If I draw this as my intermediate step, it should look like this, right? That's my intermediate step of translation. And you can think of it as just moving over to this new location. And so this is like my step one, right? I'm going to put this as my intermediate step, uh, point B. And then step two is this right here, this rotation. This is step two. Rotation. And so this is, this is what all that means. Mathematically, the equation is really simple, and you'll laugh at it. Relative motion analysis says the following. Says the following. If we, for instance, know exactly where B is, and we know where A is, then we can easily figure out position of B with respect to A. You take the derivative to get velocity. Okay. In translation only, this was gone, because the velocity between B and A never changed. Direction and magnitude were the same. So this represents all of the translation. This part right here, notice that previously when I did rotation, this guy was like a V of P, and this was VO, the fixed point. So under pure rotation, when this point is like fixed, this represented all of the rotation. So basically what I'm saying now is we're bringing the two back together, and mathematically it's like just adding the vectors together. Point A is now the point right here after it had been translated. You were tracking point A, which meant it was applied to the entire rod. And then B is rotation around A, treating A as if it was fixed at the intermediate location. OK, so that's it. So if you, if you trust this equation and the way that I've combined it, then all you have to do is go back to my vector notation where this VB with respect to A is now going to look like this, omega RBA, like so, meaning everything I said about cross products applies. We're going to find magnitudes that are omega times R. We're going to find directions where it's 90 degrees to the R vector. Okay? And I'll say this. The most important thing when you're doing this type of analysis, I can assure you, is you got to keep really, really good track of your subscripts because it's relative motion. You keep track of these subscripts and you identify this R. This R is critical. As, long, as soon as you figure out the direction of this R B with respect to A, everything is related to that R. Okay? 90 degrees is the velocity vector. Right? The normal acceleration points opposite that radial vector. Right? So everything hinges on you establishing this correct R. OK? Does that make sense? OK, so I'll give you one more equation that's very, very useful. And then I'll do a second example. OK, so here's, here's, a, here's a, a, a typical scenario, right? Given two velocities at two points on rigid body,
an unknown angular velocity, you can actually use the following equation. So here we go. I'll do magnitude of VBA like that. What did I say the magnitude was? Just the multiplication of the two scalar values omega RBA. Okay? So here's where you can actually isolate the omega. Is basically if you know the value of VBA, right? So I can actually rearrange this to be omega is just the magnitude of VBA like that divided by RBA. That's it. So that's really, really handy. It means that if I can figure out this velocity vector, right, and I just take the value of it and divide by r, I get omega. And it's, it, it helps a lot because sometimes you're not given omega, it's an unknown. Yeah. I'm, I'm giving you, an, so I'm giving you an example here where the information is not always going to be like this and this are given and you find velocity, right? Some, if you have three pieces of information, I can give two of them to you and sometimes you're going to be forced to find the third, right? I'll give you an example right now. So, but I want to make sure that you're aware of this. This is a vector subtraction. So you got to make sure that you subtract this correctly. You got to write this as I'm going to take my VB. I'm going to subtract my VA in a vector form. After it's subtracted, I get the magnitude and then I divide, okay? So here, I'll give you an example. Really, really useful. So I'm going to draw another, draw another big rod here. Okay, so I've got another one of my, my rods or sticks. And I'm going to give you four points on this stick. Point A, B, C, and D. OK, so it's a, it's a two meter long rod. Point A is halfway between B and C. D is halfway between A and C. And I'll give you some velocities here. So I tell you first that VB is 2 meter per second. So this is 2I meter per second. And I'm going to tell you that velocity of A is 1 meter per second. Okay? And that's all I'm telling you. And then I say find omega. Right? You've got an object, and the object is clearly moving with, an, with a rotation. I don't, I don't give you any other information, right? I don't even tell you if there's a fixed point of ro uh, fixed point, uh, a fixed axis. Here's my rod. All I'm telling you is that this point B moved further and faster than point A. So clearly it did something like this, and that was a rotation, right? Now I gave you this problem, and then all of a sudden I gave you two velocities, and there was no omega to be found. We have to figure out omega. How do we do it if I give you these two velocities with, with this formula? Okay? The idea is if these two velocities are known, I'm actually really, really curious about this distance here, which is effectively my omega b with respect to a, right? That, that half distance connecting the two points, that is my rb with respect to a. So if these two are moving separately, I can actually figure out my omega from there, OK? So the, the rule is, is, is the following. Here's my omega. The velocity difference between b and a looks to me like it's 1 meter per second, right? So it's just 2i minus 1i, right? 
keeping all the i's and j's together, but I'm going to make sure that I only take the magnitude afterwards. And then the distance between them is also just one meter. So 2 minus 1 is 1. So that's 1 meter per second divided by 1 meter. This is actually just 1 radian per second. And the direction is this way, clockwise. Clockwise because I, I, drew, I drew it this way where you can tell the object has to have been rotated this way. Like the, I actually didn't use, I didn't use signs to explain myself here. I'm using just simple intuition. I just basically showed you that the rod did this. The rotation must be clockwise, right? Must be that. OK? Does that make sense? So if you, if you get this. What does this omega mean when it's 1 radian per second? It means that this omega is the same angular velocity for every single point on this rigid body. Right? So this is a, the, the critical piece for omega is that. right? If you, if you want to know how much an angle is changing with respect to time, basically I can find any single point on this rod. I can draw its rotation. right? If it rotated anywhere close to the way I'm drawing it, that angle theta that it rotated, that theta applied to every single point on the rigid body. So theta per second, right, radian per second, must have applied to all points in the body. Okay? So that's how you find the omega. Now I'm going to say, well, well, if you know omega, let's find out what vc and vd are. Let's figure out all the other velocities that are on the board for all the points that we're interested in. And so now find VC and VD. Okay. So how do we do that? We can do that like, like, like this. We could say, here's my a and C, this is 1 meter, this is 1 meter per second. And now I know my omega is 1 radian per second. Okay? What do you do with a point that you don't know and you're trying to figure out? You use relative motion analysis. So if I don't know VC, I pick a point that I first know and I add it to VC with respect to A. So what this says is make sure you do plus omega cross RC with respect to A, and that will give you VC. Right? So that's the that's kind of where we're heading with all these problems, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be given multiple points, pieces of information. You can find omega. You get omega, then you can start finding the other points that were previously unknown. And so here's what I'll do. I'll show you a vector. So here's a vector method. It would be, so VA, 1 i positive plus omega. Now omega is clockwise, and my, my right hand rule says omega is positive counterclockwise. This means that this should be a negative 1k radians per second. Right? Opposite my positive sense for my right hand rule. I'm going to now cross it with my RC with respect to A. RC with respect to A is down this way. Like I said, it's C with respect to A. So the arrow points down, and that has to be negative 1J meters. OK? So this is plus 1i. 
And this is plus. So here's how you do your cross product. You can do negative 1 times negative 1 gives you a positive 1. And then a k cross j, if you know your unit vectors well, k cross j always gives you negative i. Right? Plus 1i, minus 1i, vc is equal to 0. OK? And does that make sense? It absolutely does. Point C all along, even though we didn't know it before, was actually the fixed uh, axis of rotation. It was actually doing this the whole time, like that. All right? And we didn't know that before, and I kind of hit that truth from you, and I only gave you VA and VB. But now that the omega has been solved, we can trace it back to VC. Clearly, the, the rotation was happening like that, and VC was 0. OK? So let's just say you don't like the vector method. Let's just go back and see if we can do it with just, with just geometry. OK? So here's what I would do. I would do the following. I would say, here's my 1 meter per second, point A. And I don't know what this is, but I know the following. I know this thing is rotating with omega equal to 1 radian per second. OK? So here's what's going to happen. If you think about your RC with respect to A pointing in this direction, right? If you think about this thing rotating in this direction, C, this, this point right here, has no choice but to move that way. Right? With respect to A. So if you look at this vector and the way this is rotating, it's like saying, remember, remember how I drew the other diagram? Remember how I drew this? This is equal to, draw that again. This is equal to intermediate step, right? Then rotation, right? Okay? So picture this rotation, I'm, I'm treating my point A as my fixed point now. So just think of my A as my, my sort of my fixed point under this relative motion. It rotates this way. This point, therefore, must go in this direction by a magnitude of omega RCA. So the magnitude of omega RCA is 1 radian per second, right? Just ignore, ignore the case. No, no vectors. 1 radian per second. RC with respect to A is 1 meter. The magnitude of that velocity must be 1 meter per second, but it's 1 meter per second pointing to the left. And so now you can do the following. Vc is 1 meter, right, 1k pointing to the right, oops, 1j, 1i, minus 1 pointing to the left, and that's 0. Right? So it doesn't matter which way you do it. Right? If you're comfortable with the vector method, you get, you get all your directions correct and you work with the i's and j's and the k's, you're going to get the right answer. If that is uncomfortable to you and you like to think physically, you like to draw diagrams and you like to watch as things rotate, you got to do this method, right? And to be honest, I think the students who, who, who perform well in this course are, are the ones who actually can do both. Right? If they, you know, they're, on, they're in an exam and it's a stressful situation and you're, you're familiar with all your homework assignments and you do it one way, if you have some extra time, right, do it the other way, check your answer, and, uh, and those are typically, that's, that's typically how you solve engineering problems, right? Do it more than one way. Yeah? Okay, the, quest, the question is, is there going to be a question which says, can you find the velocity of the whole rod? OK? Is that a valid question, the way that it was worded? No, because the rod is a rigid body. The rigid body has lots of particles glued together. We're interested in finding velocities of points. In fact, in a case like this, all the points have different velocities. So we want to know specifically, right? What is the velocity at the end of the rod, at the middle of the rod, et cetera? The one thing you will be asked, though, for rigid bodies, what is the angular velocity of the rigid body? 
because the angular velocity applies to the whole thing, right? OK? Any questions? Should we do point D? Let's do point D. It's for fun. So I'm going to do point D. So here we go. Lots of repetition here. So let's do VD is VA plus VD with respect to A. Yeah. How did I know it's that way? So I drew my RC with respect to A this way. And I told you that my omega was clockwise. So it, swing, it swings this way. Right? So that's just the direction of motion, right? I, I'm telling you this is my vector. This is my point with respect to A. And it's swinging like this. So it has to go that way, right? 90 degrees. OK, so you could do it this way. And I'm going to show you, this is now going to be, uh, let's do VD is equal to VA. So this is now 1i. And then plus, I'll do this again, negative 1k. It's the same omega. And I'll cross it this time with halfway between. So it's going to be 0.5 negative j meters. All right. And you can see what's happening. Plus 1i plus. This is negative 1 times negative 1 half is positive 1 half. k cross j in that order, negative i. So plus 1 minus 1 half, 0.5i. To no one's surprise, it's half the velocity of a. OK? OK? So, you know, and if you, if you, haven't, if you haven't caught on yet, I've been doing this rather quickly. k cross j is negative i. j cross k is plus i. And there's actually six different combinations of these things. right? And so I'll, I'll teach you one trick. And that is, if you think of the i, j, k's as in a circle, if you go in the right order in the alphabet, The cross products always end up positive. And if you go in the opposite order of the alphabet, it's negative. So i cross j is a positive k, right? Because you're going in that right order. If you go j cross k, that's the right order in the alphabet. That's my plus i. If you flip them, negative, right? So you should get familiar with all of this. I'll give you one more piece. So you should really practice those. Has anyone seen a pattern yet so far? This is, a, this is point C, and it was 0 meter per second. This was point B, 2 meter per second, 1 meter per second, 0.5 meter per second. All right. So this is actually a linear profile. All the other points of all the, of on the rod, it is a direct linear proportion of its distance away from the point in which it's rotating. Right? And that's a function of the fact that it's omega r. Omega is a constant. Or uh, omega is figured out for that one instant in time and applies to all the points. And then you multiply it to how far you are away from the point of rotation. So it's just linear. Doesn't matter. Any single point, you can just do that. OK? Any, any questions? Thoughts? Yeah, another great question. Wonderful. Here, one last thing here. So you know how I picked D with respect to A, right? What if you just did it with another point? 
I really, really like VC now. VC is 0. And I know what VC is. Guess what you can do? You just do this, automatically cancel, right? And then you have this as your negative 1k cross with a VD with respect to C. Guess what? VD with respect to C is straight up. It's a positive 0.5j is your RD with respect to C, right? And immediately you get that the answer is 0.5i, right? So that's a great, great point. Always look for multiple points, and again, to use it to check your answer. Yeah? Uh, if you wanted to do this after X amount of time, what would you be able to do in order to find angular velocity again? Would you have to do what you did earlier? Yeah. So the, que the question is, what about if it's like multiple points in time? Um, all of this that I've showed you is for an instantaneous moment in time, right? So if I, if I say something happened three seconds later, um, you better be now hunting for information that applies to three seconds later, like we did in the first problem, using your kinematic equations. Okay? And last one. Bingo. That's the topic of next class. There is always a point where the object appears to be rotating at a given instant in time. It happens to be called the instantaneous center of zero velocity. Okay? All right. See you guys on Friday. <laughs>